Ruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming, for attending. Uh, welcome to uh, our house. Uh, again, the uh, new normal. Um, this week's topic is uh, after Lagba Omer. <clears throat> Today is the day after Lagba Omer. Lagba Omer, again, the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. <clears throat> and I realized that even though 33 days have passed, I really haven't learned nor thought enough about the Omer period and its connection to my life as a Jew. And I thought that many of you may have similar feelings. The question becomes, why do we count the 49 days of the Omer? Our rabbis tell us that at the time of the exodus from Egypt, our ancestors were on the 49th level of impurity. Had they fallen to the 50th level, they would have entered into the spiritual abyss, so to speak, a black hole. And God would then not have been able to redeem them. So on the day of Pesach, Passover, God, with his ultimate mercy, took the whole Jewish nation from the 49th level of impurity and elevated them all to the 49th level of purity. However, this was a total gift, not something that they had really earned. This can be compared to someone who has taken, been taken up a mountain by a helicopter and he's able to see and enjoy the magnificence of the vista of the view on that mountain. He is then told that if he really wants to appreciate the mountain's true beauty, he will have to climb it himself. And the climb, which took only minutes in a helicopter, would now take 49 days to complete. The helicopter ride had shown him which path he would have to take to be able to successfully scale the mountain and reach its peak. And so too, God Almighty took us out of Egypt and on that day elevated us to the 49th level of purity. And then, on the second day of Pesach, he told us that we would now have to retrace our steps up that spiritual mountain so that on the 50th day we would be worthy of receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. If you stop and think about it, if the Jews were on the 49th level of impurity and needed to reach the 49th level of purity, instead of counting 49 days, we really should count 98. Why only 49? So the example can be given that a Jew is like a, a silver menorah. Imagine, if you will, you go to a yard sale and there you see a black candelabra, all tarnished, and you pay a few dollars for it. You go home. And you take the dross, you take the black off of the candelabra, and you realize that it's a silver uh, candelabra, and it shines immediately. What did you do to make it shine? And the answer is nothing. All you did was remove the negativity, the dross, the blackness, from the silver menorah, and it shone. And so too with a Jew. A Jew, intrinsically by his very nature, is holy. He has a godly soul. And the only thing a person needs to do is remove the negativity from that soul, from that person, and that person will automatically shine. Now, what's interesting is this counting is not done by the Jewish courts or any national body of the nation of Israel. It's done by each and every Jew on an individual basis. Those who avail themselves of the opportunity to elevate their midot, their character traits during this period, will reap great spiritual benefits. However, those who allow these days to pass without giving any thought to what these days represent will not be able to truly appreciate what spiritual connection there is between the holidays of Pesach and that of Shavuot. Now, the sphere of period begins with the Omer offering, which consisted of barley, which was considered at that time animal food, fodder. This alludes to the fact that at the time of the exodus from Egypt, our ancestors were on the spiritual level of animals. The next 50 days are used to elevate ourselves to the level of man, so that on Shavuot, we may partake of the sacrifice of the Shnei Lechem, of the two loaves, actually of chametz, made out of wheat, human food. So the goal of the Sphira period is for us to, uh, to elevate ourselves from the level of animal, and to attempt to reach the level of human. Now, it's interesting, Rabbi Yochanan ben Duri, at the end of chapter 2, in the Mishnah of Edyo, says, 
that the term of punishment for the wicked in purgatory is from Pesach through Shavuos. Since the beginning, from the time of the exodus from Egypt, this period has been designated as a time for removing the stains from our souls and purifying them from their contamination, whether in this world or the next. Now the Torah commands us to count not only days, but also weeks. It says you shall count for yourselves, and then it says seven seven Shabbosos, seven Sabbaths. And the Torah refers to these weeks as Shabbos to teach us that the Shabbat is the primary day of the week. And from it, all the other days receive their sustenance. As we know, the number seven alludes to the seven days of creation, each week of the Sphera, again, Sphere from counting. One has the ability to recreate his own personal world and in some way help to bring the world in general closer to the state of purity that God so desires for his world. The Zohar says that God wanted to marry the nation of Israel, but they were in a state of nida, of a menstruant type of woman, so to speak, spiritual impurity. They needed to purify themselves for seven weeks. The reason why they needed seven weeks instead of the natural seven days that a woman goes through was because the extraordinary amount of impurity that they had accumulated during their years in Egypt. Now, these seven weeks also correspond to what we call the seven ushpazin, the seven guests that we welcome into our sukkah on each day of the holiday of Sukkot. As Elio Kitov says in the Book of Our Heritage, every week of the counting of the sphere is an allusion to one of these personalities. First week, first week alludes to Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, who personifies the attribute of loving kindness. Through his selfless love and devotion to all people, the whole world was brought closer to God Almighty. Second week alludes to Yitzhak Avinu, Yitzhak our father, Isaac, who personifies the attribute of strength of character. Through him, the whole world learned to fear God. The third week alludes to Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, who personifies the attribute of beauty, Tiferet or emes, truth. As the Torah says, Yaakov was Ishtam, a perfect man blending together the kindness of his grandfather and the severity of his father. Fourth week alludes to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, who personifies the attribute of eternity, Netzach, which is Torah. Moshe gave his life for the Torah and was thereby able to ensure its eternity and not only that, the eternity of the whole nation of Israel for all generations. The fifth week alludes to the Aaron HaKohen, Aaron the high priest, who personifies the attribute of splendor, Hod. He brought humility, gratitude, and peace into the world. As it says in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, he was a Oev Shalom and a Rodev Shalom, a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. He loved all of mankind and brought them nearer to the Torah. The sixth week alludes to Yosef HaTzadik, to Joseph, the righteous one, who personifies the virtue which lies at the foundation of all morality, Yisod. Yosef's righteousness was the foundation of our existence in exile. He was the first Jew to live and bring up his children in a totally immoral society. Yet, he was still able to instill within them true Torah values. In fact, two of his sons became the two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, of Israel. The seventh week alludes to Dovin Amela, King David, who personifies the attribute of Malchut, of kingship, and just as he had no years of his own, and had to have them given to him from Adam Rishon, first man, so too. His whole life was one of humility, self-sacrifice, and teshuva, repentance. He taught the world to sing songs of praise to Hilim, psalms to the king of the world. Now, each of these seven Midot's character traits are closely interwined and are all interdependent. 
None exists in isolation. Kindness without strength of character becomes soft-heartedness. Glory without kindness leads to sin. And none of these qualities is complete unless kindness, chesed, is part of their makeup. Now, one might think, why bother with the sphere, with the counting now? After all, two-thirds of the counting is already finished. And the Marsha, a commentator in Moed Cotton in the Talmud, states that Lagba Omer marks the beginning of the final third stage of the days of the Omer. The emergence of the Jewish nation can be compared to the three stages of birth of a baby. The embryo, developing in the womb of its mother, the actual birth, and then the growth of the child. So too, the history of the world is divided into three stages. First 2,000 years were before the giving of the Torah, again, which are called the years of Toh, void, which brought about the flood. The second 2,000 years is after the giving of the Torah, and again, a world with order. And then the third 2,000 years, which we are in now, which are the coming of Mashiach, the Messiah, may he come quickly in our time, which the last third is the most important. We have a saying, Akron, Akron, Chaviv, the best is kept for last. So we see that it is never too late. And now we also learn this out from Rabbi Akiva, whose 24,000 students died during the period of the Sphira. What did Rabbi Akiva do after this tragedy? Did he give up? No. He started all over again, and this time with only five students. It's interesting, out of the 24,000, we don't know one name of any of the students. But these five students became the lights of the world, and among them was Rav Meir, Rav Shimon Bar Yechoi, again the author of the Zohar of Kabbalah. The Hassam Sofer brings up an interesting point. When a person brings a Toda sacrifice, which was a sacrifice that was brought if someone was saved by in a miraculous way from heaven. He would bring along with the animal that he would sacrifice a mincha offering, a meal offering, which consisted of fine flour and oil. He would bring 40 loaves of bread, 30 of which were matzah, and 10 which were chumash, which was very unusual, not usually brought in the temple, anything that was rose that had eagle to it. Again, the chumitz alludes to one's body and the matzah to one's soul. Normally, when one would bring a toe to sacrifice, he would bring all 40 loaves at the same time. However, when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they did not, they did not, excuse me, they did not, um, <laughs> they did not have enough be on a high enough level to bring both together. So on Passover, Pesach, when they freed all the spiritual sparks in Egypt, they partook of the spiritual part of the Toda sacrifice, symbolized by the matzah. And then on Shavuos, when they reached the level of sanctification of the body, they then brought the Shnei Lechem, the two loaves of Chometz, which represented the more material aspects of the body. Now this raises a question. Why then do we all eat matzah on Pesach, on Passover, and only the priests were allowed to eat these two loaves, the Shnei Lechem, on Shavuot? The answer is that every Jew, every Jew, has within him a lofty soul and can therefore partake of matzah. However, at Mount Sinai, even though the whole nation was able to reach the level of sanctification of the body, that was only temporary. It wasn't realistic to believe that it was a state that normal people could maintain. Only those Sadiqim Gemurim, those completely righteous individuals symbolized by the priest, would be able to retain that level of sanctity. Therefore, it was only they, the priest, who partook of the two loaves of Chometz on Shavuos. So today is the 34th day of the Omer, which is every day has a distinction to it. Today is the distinction of the Yisod of Hod, as we mentioned every week, has a different theme, which represents Yosef HaTzadik, Joseph the Righteous One, our pristine example of a Jew succeeding spiritually in the exile, and also the other, 
of, of Aaron, HaKohen, Aaron the priest, the paradigm of love and humility. So the word hod, according to Rabbi Shimon Jacobson, is from the word hoda, meaning thank you. The essence of Judaism is saying thank you. Thank you to God and thank you to man. However, with all of our many blessings, many times we find it difficult to realize just how blessed we really are. We all have a tendency of taking our many blessings for granted. This can best be illustrated by a story. It was told of Reb Nussan Nutta Shapira, who was the rab of, rabbi, had a leading rabbi of Krakow, who lived in the early part of the 17th century. He held the most prestigious position in the Jewish world and due to the city's prominence as a bastion of Torah life and scholarship. However, Reb Nussan felt incomplete since the demands of the community left him little time to follow his true desire, his true passion, which was learning Torah. And so when a smaller city of Betich offered him a position as their rabbi, he eagerly accepted their offer since he felt that being the rabbi of a smaller community would allow him more time to study Torah. As you can imagine, the people of the city of Krakow were devastated. Again, when they heard their beloved and saintly rabbi was leaving. They tried everything they could to convince him to stay, but nothing they could say or do would change his mind. And on the day when he was to leave, a wagon was sent by the town of Betich to light, load up his possessions. And as they were loading the wagon up, some representatives came to him from the court. And they said to him, we know that you're leaving. However, there are two litigants that are waiting at the court to be judged. And there's no rabbi available to judge them. As the last act before you go, would you please adjudicate the case? And he said, of course he would. And he went to the courtroom. <clears throat> And there were two men, a rich man and another man who looked more like a scholar. And the rich man got up first and began to speak. And he said that a while back, I was coming back from a business trip. And when I got off the train, I'm Jewish, I was hungry. And I wondered that maybe there was some place in the train station for me to buy something that I could eat. And so I looked, and sure enough, I saw that there was a man, this man, who was a bagel seller, that he was selling bagels in the train station, bagel vendor. So I went up to him, and I purchased a bagel, and while I did that, I kind of, kind of thought out loud, and I asked what blessing should be made on the bagel, whether we make a mazonas, or whether we make for like cake, or whether it's bread, and when I asked the question out loud, he answered me, but not with a yes or a no, a simple answer. He went through all of the commentaries of what the rabbis say in the, in the Talmud, in the Shulchan Aruch. And I looked at him in amazement, and I said, you're not a bagel vendor, you're a scholar. And he just smiled. And I said to him, you know, I have an idea for you. And I asked him how much he made, and he told me. And I said, I will pay you three times as much. But I, I have a son at home who needs a malamed, who needs a teacher. So why don't we strike a deal? You will teach my son in the morning. And then in the afternoon, you can study all by yourself and I'll pay for the whole day. And he agreed. And we began this relationship. And I have to tell you, it went very, very well. My son was thrilled with his new teacher. He was learning very well and growing. And this went on. And then three weeks ago, I had a business trip that I had to take, and I knew I'd be gone for three weeks. So I, I didn't want to make my son's teacher wait for the money. So I paid him for three weeks in advance. And I left. Today, I came back from my business trip, and I was in the train station again, hungry as usual. And I wondered if there was, again, maybe another bagel vendor where I could get something to eat at, on the way home. And to my amazement, what did I see? My son's malami, this bagel banger, was back selling bagels at the train station. 
And I looked at him and I said, what's this all about? And he just looked at me. Anyways, I brought him here. And with that, he sat down. And then the Talmud Chacham, the bagel vendor, stood up. And he looked at Reb Nassim and he said, everything the man has told you is true. His son is wonderful and I enjoyed it greatly. And things went very well. As he said, three weeks ago, he was going on a trip and he gave me the money for the three weeks. I took the money, I went home, and I gave the money to my wife. And I said, Chayla, look at this. And she looked at me and she wasn't happy and I was surprised. What woman doesn't like seeing that? And instead she looked down and I said to her, Chayla, what's wrong? And she said to me, Moshe, we lost God. I said, how do we lose God? How do you lose God? She said, we lost God. I said, how? And she said, you know, before you worked for this rich man, you'd go to the train station every morning. And I'd say, no, Moshe, are we going to have food to eat tonight? Are we going to put food on the table? Are we going to feed our children? And you would look up to heaven and you would say, God will... God, will, God will, will give us. And then it would be Thursday, we get ready for Shabbos. And I'd ask you again, Moshe, will we have food on the table? Will we have wine? Will we have candles? Will we have meat for Shabbos? And you look up to heaven and you said, God will take care of it. He will supply us with what we need. And this happened all the time. Ever since you've worked for that man, for that rich man, not once, not once, have you ever mentioned God's name? Moshe, we've lost God. And he sat down. And Reb Nussin heard this case. He looked at all the people assembled there. He said, if there are people like this in Krakow, then I'm not going anywhere. And Reb Nussin stayed in Krakow until his passing. And just like Chaim, pardon me, just like Moshe in the story, I'm afraid that we have lost God. God is telling us an important message. Go back to basics. Relook what is important in life. You know, we spend our lives trying to make a living instead of living our lives trying to, spend, trying to make a life. We're, we are all basically in a timeout. God's hit the pause button. We need to reassess our relationship with our family, especially our spouses, our children, our elderly parents, if you're fortunate enough to have them, friends, work. You know, yesterday wasn't good enough. We have an opportunity to move forward and to grow. Not to be go back to what was normal, but to have a better normal, to make us grow. We need to connect with God again. Not just in our hearts and our minds, but in words and actions. Let us look forward to a better tomorrow for us, for our families, for our friends, for our communities, for the world. And the only way that happens is with a connection to God Almighty. May he bless us with the counting of the Omer. This year, that we have earned the merit to herald in the coming of Mashiach Sekenu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless and be well. Stay safe. Stay happy. Stay healthy. God bless you all.